Well, it I, I have been following your work here for the the last entire year, so it's really exciting to finally uh, meet you. Uh, I find that a lot of the people who are talking about concatenative sound synthesis um, are often coming from a real scientific perspective, and uh, the pa the papers that have been done on this topic are all very heady, mathy data science sort of stuff. So it's been, um, as an, as coming from a music production and kind of an artist angle where I know very, you know, math just a lot of the time sends me in a, in a confusion spiral. A lot of this, you know, top level, uh, data science stuff. De definitely. I found it really refreshing uh, listening to your talks and um, the presentations that you've given on this topic because I like how you always bring it back to artistic intent, to what you're trying to do creatively, and uh, that's very very much my language and 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 um, it, so it's 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 exciting to speak to another artist who is using. Uh, concatenative sound synthesis to achieve a creative vision. There's not a lot of us out there. No. <laughs> I mean, I think that's part of, I don't know, I mean, I, I have a, a slight bias for that, but I think a lot of um, academia in, in the context of music just mirrors, like, I guess, a STEM approach. So it, it's very, like, even if you're a, a creative person, you tend to publish or produce work that is scientific because that is the gesture of what research is. You know, even the idea of, of research in an aesthetic field mirrors that kind of thing. So I think that sort of tips the scale a little bit to where when people do produce things like that, they tend to skew that way. Obviously, some of the stuff does require some sort of maths and heavy stuff, much of and most of which is above my head as well. But I think the the things that people then choose to talk about, yeah, do get kind of skewed a bit that way, which is, you know, unfortunate. Yeah, I guess it could be useful. I mean, it depends on the type of person one is. I mean, you know? it's totally necessary. You know, I mean, you, you have to talk about things in those terms in order to put the ideas down in, in real solid terms. And I have huge appreciation and and respect for the uh, data scientists that have made huge progress in this field, even though I cannot understand the intricacies of their poetry, you know, uh, it's their, 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 their work is the giant's shoulders that I feel like I'm standing on. Yeah, totally. As, as you said it there, like, I think some of it is necessary in order to, or it is necessary if, if you're speaking to other data scientists or programmers to have things in terms that make sense like that. But then in terms of perhaps where it differs from, let's say, like traditional STEM or something is that um, there aren't scientists then going and getting poetic with some of the stuff. I guess that's not 100 percent true. But, you know, w within the context of music, there's generally people making music or art as well. So there's like a, an abstracted layer of application to some of these, you know, uh, algorithms and techniques and theories and things, which um, is intrinsic to the field. But yeah, so yeah, I'm glad that you've enjoyed the videos and stuff. For me, it's it's interesting because I think I I know some of the stuff, and over the years I've learned more about the stuff, and I, I kind of have an okay understanding of what's happening technically and my ability to implement it at you know various technical levels, depending on on what it is exactly I'm doing. But I you know my concerns tend to be elsewhere often. And it was really interesting seeing that that video that you sent where you had uh, kind of like a a story arc, I'll call it, of of like the the corpora and how it evolves over time, which is really interesting. Like I've not I've not seen that kind of approach in terms of the the curation of the corpora as a series of narrative steps. Hi, my name is Ben Cantill, and all of the interesting organic sound design that you're hearing in there was made with concatenative sound synthesis. Let me solo all of it.
Now, in the mix there, you'll hear water sounds, and there's even little segments of little voices in there. Yeah, you can kind of hear a voice breaking through, and it's mixed up with all sorts of sounds, mostly organic sounds, sounds from the earth, water, wind. We've got all the elements represented there. And all of these sounds are coming together using a variety of different algorithms under the broad umbrella of concatenative sound synthesis. What sounds I use in this project and when I use them are dictated by this storyline right here, which is based on the Genesis creation narrative. So when the world is created, we'll start off with the sounds of an empty world and then work up to vegetation and animals and then eventually to humans and then sounds that represent consciousness, like sounds that are made by human beings and civilization and instruments and stuff like that. And you can see that these sounds will come together to tell the classic creation story. And these are all the major plot points as the corpus opens up. This project is partially a meditation on the thinking that goes into curating a corpus. This is a curated corpus that gets bigger with time for the expressed purpose of telling a story. Which is really quite interesting and poetic. And, and like it, it was nice to see that kind of concern or that kind of um, inflection in what you were interested in, you know? You know, thank you for saying that. And I thought that you'd resonate with that because, like I said, you're one of the only people that I've seen that talks about how curating the corpus is a creative action on its own. And the thinking that goes into creating a corpus is is its its own artistic uh, decision. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm new to it. I figure about just about everyone doing this is new to it. But... Um, uh, that that turned out to be the defining kind of creative decision of this. What sounds do I use? Because here, you know, you have in concatenative sound synthesis, I feel like a lot of the time, like this chef throwing together ingredients into a soup. Every now and then you get that magic recipe and you don't always necessarily know what made it magic. You just know that these ingredients kind of add up and play well together. I, I think that, uh, that 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 idea of working with uh, uh, concatenative sounds also kind of clashes with with uh, option paralysis. You know, like you can you can throw anything into the you know into the database and hopefully something cool will come out on the other end. But what's to stop you from throwing everything in there? Like. What? Where do you? Where do you make these, these, um, these lines of this is something I do want and this is something I don't want? I didn't want that those decisions to be entirely arbitrary because there are so many sounds out there. I mean, I it it is interesting the the idea that like I'm gonna use all of free sound for a corpus or I'm gonna download all of contact and use it as a corpus. I'm still really interested in these like massive databases and how you know how that can can sync up with uh, what we're trying to do with the concatenative stuff. But, um, you know, meditating on on what ingredients to use and why to use them be, emerged as a really important theme in my project. Yeah, and, and there's something like, I, I guess a, a very early realization for me was the idea that given an infinitely large corpus, the output would sound like the input, just because there would be a corresponding nugget that that like is the same almost like a library of babble kind of thing like this conversation we're having now would have already happened and if we had this conversation in the corpus and ran our conversation through it it would sound exactly as it does now because everything would be represented so the the fact that it is some kind of translation process itself is an aesthetic decision to even do that in the first place so by doing that you already make like a blanket things of not everything will be as it went in like it's it's like you you're you've opened up google translate and there's two panes like that's already gonna happen you know like if you put english on both and hit put whatever on one side you're gonna get the same thing on the other side so having that realization fairly early on was kind of useful and then i think some of it is also as like a secondary byproduct of not having i mean i have a fair amount of like samples and sample libraries but i, I don't have like 
terabytes upon terabytes of samples, you know, so like, you know, starting from a place like that, it meant that it was fairly restricted in terms of what I would put in. And I would try to put a lot in, but it's still meaningless compared to like infinity, obviously. Um, so that was kind of an interesting thing where knowing the process itself is going to transform it. And the transformation is why you're using the process. So then it's it's almost like a like a quantization or a conceptual quantization of what you want that thing to be transformed by. And that being said, I've gotten really into more recently as well as like using it to kind of leverage an uncanny valley type thing where you you let's say you have like a recording like I did a, a, a remix remix project for a friend where I took the recording um, made a corpus out of that and then fed the recording back into itself. And what you get is kind of a self-similar thing where the sounds are the same, but it's a little rough around the edges. It's, it's, it sounds a little granular because it's all cut up, but it, it kind of sounds almost plausible, not really, in, a, in like kind of an uncanny valley sense where I kind of like what's happening there. She make her destroy again. She make her destroy again. Pinky ring is what they gave you. So you take it. Oh, the tears. The bombs I dropped. Hit your stash spot. None of the harm off. Shoot down your skybox. I get respect from the ground to the sky. Yeah. Protection from the sky dog. Dog you bad. Don't leave her hair look red. I love this idea of un uncanny valley. This this uh, term has come up a lot while exploring, you know, corpus design. And what you were talking about doing, um, um, a friend of mine did this. This guy called uh, Vibris. He's been my internet friend through this rabbit hole I've been going down. And uh, he got into Audio Guide by Ben Hackbarth at about the same time I did. And one of the first things he did is, all right, I'm going to put the, the target into the corpus with a bunch of other stuff. And so the idea is, is that it'll cre recreate the target, but with mistakes. And it's those mistakes, those little glitches, that's going to make it really interesting. You know, it's like it cracks in the firmament, you know? Which, which is super interesting. And, and like, I, I think when I... I mean, I started doing that like just as, as like with straight concatenative synthesis where it sounds super granularly, but some stuff more recently, I kind of did, I don't even remember what, what prompted me to do it. I was like, okay, let me just make some samples of some symbol I have. And then I kind of played percussion stuff into it. And seeing the video back, I was like, that's kind of, it was weird because like, I, that's not what's happening, but it's kind of not, not what's happening. Like it was weird to watch because it was, kind of plausible and, and not at the same time. Which, yeah, is super interesting. And I think there's more, I think, to that. I, I think at some point it start, almost starts wrapping into like like a machine learning, deep fake-esque thing where, you know, like the the uncanny valley becomes part of the overall, like overarching aesthetic gesture. I think for me at the moment, it's it's like it's an aspect of it, but it isn't the overall gesture. But I think there's there's um there's scope where that's going to be more the case or in certain kinds of visual art, at least like that's very much the case, like where the uncanny valley is the work or, or a big part of the work, you know? Absolutely. I'm a huge fan of GAN art and I know that neural networks and machine learning, they're, they're similar, but not the same thing. I'm, I find myself, you know, correcting people a lot of the time when I mention that I'm doing machine learning sound design, they're like, Oh, like neural networks. Uh, not quite. My machine learning friends would be upset to hear you say that, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but the aesthetically, you're absolutely right. It's like uh, right now, the my performance partner that I work with, um, Zebler, he's been going down an awesome wormhole with uh, training GAN networks on different things. And 
he made this video uh, called for a track called Ripple Continuum that's just going through different kinds of forests and foliage and mountains and rivers. It's gorgeous. been feeding it really kind of strange things like he just uploaded a big library of of porn and uh the grotesque like like permutations of almost human weirdness that comes out of that it's it it it, it, it it's so interesting and um at the same time um i just uh i've, I've been experimenting with uh with um throwing orgasm sounds in my corpus and uh, th this is for uh, my NMF-based concatenation. Um, in Audio Guide, it ends up, or, or you know, in that kind of a descriptor-based concatenation, it ends up, you end up really hearing the sounds, like, oh, that's clearly, those are clearly orgasm sounds. But in the, in the machine learning NMF-based concatenation, um, it's like, it's an imitation, you know? And, uh, and it comes out sounding... Um, really musical because the best corpus is one where all of the notes are present. So, like, um, I, for instance, experimented with monks chanting, and it turns out that's a lousy corpus because they just have one note that they're doing for an hour, and it's like if you if you're doing that note, then great, but you might as well just use the recording. Um, and something is as, as as weird and varied as like a whole bunch of random people's orgasm sounds actually produces enough note and variety that you can create drums and melodies and stuff. And it sounds like drums and melodies, but there's a little bit of that. Hey, that's is, is that are those are those sounds of passion? You know, it kind of has that that kind of unca uncanny valley effect where it's almost human but not quite. It's uncomfortably not human. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something with, I, I think, when you start getting into sound sources like that, like I've done like uh, corpus stuff, like where I've had porn stuff in there with other things I, as well. I saw that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you end up with like an interesting thing where it becomes almost like a, a plunder phonics overload where you hear references that you don't immediately process. So like, like I don't know if you've listened to much of like John Oswald stuff, but like it's, it's like hyper sampled. This is like, I think, pre-concat synthesis technique stuff, but like super edited pop music references where it's just like half a second of some Whitney Houston song. Like it's just this overload thing where you're, you, you hear the reference and your brain fires that little synapse, but not long enough to know what it is or why. So it's like this overload of like, I know, but I don't know. I know, but I don't know. Using sources like porn and things like this in it as well does something similar because like I mean it's different in an NMF context where the sounds get a little bit more transformed in a more literal context like with an audio guide thing or some of the stuff I've done you hear these sounds in the mix of other stuff and it's like it, it kind of um yeah it, it's just kind of like a weird almost pseudo subconscious thing that's happening that is really interesting because you're absolutely right. It's it's the pseudo subconscious when sounds are all mixed together and going by really quickly, and and they're not random. They're there to kind of create a musical gesture, snare drum into kick. You know, um, that but but you can tell that they're oh these are foley sounds or these are the sounds of. Of uh, this is I've used like water sounds a lot, and lately, right now, I'm using a lot of radio sounds, like random static interference. I, I think that you, it's it's a really interesting trick of the brain because your brain is following it as music, but it's also recognizing all of these little bits, almost almost recognizing, you know. And I, I think that maybe that's 
it, you know, yeah, I, I think that you've you've framed it really well there. I hadn't really thought about it, but um, in in those terms, but the way that it tickles your subconscious, I just I love stuff that kind of tricks you. You know, I, I it it feels like magic almost. Like I've 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 tripped you out. You know, that's always what I'm trying to get back to in music, kind of get people to go like, oh my god, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what. <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting thing that, like, like for a few years, I did with with my partner. We did these performances where we had um, DMX lights that we did, kind of visual light granular synthesis, like where we took an image and then you would zoom in on a section of it, and that made a color palette. And then, as you would with like any kind of granular synthesis, you would trigger random things within it with varying periods at varying rates, and some interesting stuff would happen. So let's say like you're in a dark room. And you have uh, very short blips of colored light in within, let's say, like a, a certain palette, um, because I, I don't know the physics of, or not the physics, but the physiology of it. But our, you know, our pupils aren't perfect, and they don't respond very quickly. So, like, if you just have very short blips of light, the light kind of decays, even though it went away completely. Um, so you get like this visual phenomena that's it's almost like an optical illusion, but becomes very overwhelming which i think was really interesting and something that i i then used in some of my like performance stuff with like like drums and stuff as well but i think that idea of um experiencing something beyond what you can qualify that you're experiencing like it, it's like above your your threshold of saturation you know right like an information saturation kind of an overload totally yeah, I yeah I get that a lot from uh, Ryoji Ikeda. Um, I love his work, and maybe it's because there's just so much data. I finally got to see him once. I saw him at Sonar Barcelona. And um, like you said, it was so intense that it was almost uncomfortable because it was like, it was just loud and strobe lights and huge screen just going. And I was so excited to see Ryoji Ikeda, but about 30 minutes into it, because we were all sitting, I actually fell asleep <laughs> and, and like j briefly and afterwards it disturbed me. I was like, here I am seeing one of my favorite artists. How did that happen? And I think it's because something about the flashing lights and the, it, 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 it did like at some point your brain maybe gets a little overloaded and, and, and kind of shuts down. Um, that, that, that is a really interesting angle though, when it comes to granular and, um, and concatenative sound synthesis is that, you have so much variation and it's so rich that you could just unpack it forever and and there will still be stuff in there that you're maybe missing. Yeah, totally. And I think and the way that a lot of like granular stuff is generally leveraged tends to be very smooth, like like time stretch, like like we want it to sound buttery. That's usually the the results, but obviously it doesn't need to be. So if we have the grain like grain stuff where it's much more chaotic or in some sort of sound design or like in his specific case, like where you have very um, disjointed sounds and, and often moving very quickly, it's a very different sensation, which yeah can be quite overwhelming in a way that uh, is positive. You know, like like people who like spicy food, it's like this is painful, but I like it. You know, I love that. I just I imagine Ryoji Ikeda as a hot sauce. So. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's going going into um, uh, kind of the granular end of of CCAT. 
Um, I, I've found that a lot of the time, I, it's like you have these worlds. You have the world of, of I want to have a lot of variation, and I want it to be really interesting and deep and dynamic, but I want full control over it. So that would be you just using a timeline. I've done that before. Create 30 tracks, start dragging audio into it, and now I've created a phrase, you know. Um, on the other side of that, you can get to a lot of high variation using either granular synthesis or really cleverly programming samplers or having an interesting, you know, sample variation going on in your hardware or something like that. There's ways to do it progr uh, programmatically. Uh, but most of the time, when you have uh, something programmatic like granular synthesis or I like to dump like tons of samples into a sampler and move through them in interesting ways, most of the time it's random. You're, you are really, truly just relying on either randomness or, yeah, randomness. It's, it's some kind of, of decision-making process that isn't your own. And I find that these are the two polar inverses of each other, you know? True intent where every sound is curated and decided upon and put under the timeline with each other. Or, computer, you just decide something for me, you know, pull it up, use, use noise or sample and hold, use... Uh, some sort of other module to decide, but you decide. It's going to be basically random. And I find with concatenative sound synthesis, it is like this this really interesting and unexplored realm right in between. Like, it's almost random, but I'm, I'm saying, give me a sound. It might be a random sound, but give me something that kind of can represent this snare drum. Give me a sound that kind of represents this bass. And uh, so I feel like it's like this like it you, you you have intent coming together with machine decision making in a really interesting way and um this has been actually a topic of you, you see i'm struggling to talk about it i'm i'm having a tough time writing about this cuz all all of this work that i'm doing right now i'm writing about in my masters uh research thesis and um all of these are wormholes where i'm sure you you could just talk about randomness in electronics and how we deceive i mean how we how we come to um the machine making decisions for us that's a whole other paper on its own and uh, so I'm, I'm trying to think of really eloquent ways to kind of describe where concatenative sound synthesis fits in that larger field yeah i mean interesting like just hearing you talk about this now it makes me think a little bit about agency and by that i specifically mean so if if you're let's say like at a like an MPC or something like that and you have 16 samples and you're, you're programming a beat you have enough um uh sort of throughput as a human being to generate the information that you want from that i mean you might have some complex beats but it's within the domain of that you may be able to plausibly if not physically do them imagine the thing that needs to happen Whereas if you're getting to like a like a state of where you're dealing with a granular synthesis or concatenative synthesis or something very detailed or edited, it exceeds um, unless you're going to take like really really long periods of time, which is also possible to generate the information required. So if you if if like I asked you to make um, you know like a concatenative resynthesis of anything of, of us talking right now of birds or whatever and gave you a pool of samples. And you had to manually cut and put every like the the it's an unreasonable amount of things to do as a human being and for one you probably won't be able to do it well just because we're not our brains don't work that way so well but it's an amount of information that's more than we generally can generate so i think a lot of times like when we're using random processes it's to do that it's to give us a, a an above human amount of of generation you know, like you, you put a noise or like a random LFO on something because like you don't have the brain space to pick a, you know, a series of 500 numbers that that, that are, you know, useful for, for something. But a random generator might will, will happily do that, you know, for infinity. So there's something about like using processes that exceed what we can do or what we can imagine or or both. Um, and then I guess there's an aesthetic side of then how you manage that. So whether you want it to be purely random, whether you want it to be some kind of 
um, bounded randomness or, or using sample and hold or of some kind of physical process or otherwise, or in this case using a descriptor or some kind of analytical based concatenation, but it's like a, an agent of yourself in that sense, you know, so like thinking of, of agency, but specifically how is it like relates to that, like I'm not strong enough to lift, you know, like a barrel of concrete. So you get a forklift to do that. I don't know if that's how people move concrete, but like um, the same thing with with when we're using processes or automated processes or random processes, it's to do generate amount of information that we can't, you know, if that kind of makes sense. So I think some of just like using the whatever process we're doing, be it random or resynthesis to generate material is a way of of generating stuff that you then as a human being can apply some aesthetic filter to and be like, yes, I I'll use this sample that it brought back or synthesized. This is the one or not, you know, and, and so you're there is more like an arbiter of, of the results as opposed to the, you know, the one pulling, well, I guess you are pulling the levers, but like, I don't know, that kind of went on a mixed metaphor, weird ramble there. But um, in terms of like where you yourself are located in that process, I guess it just made me think about that. No, this is great because I, I find that I have a tough time talking about this, you know. Um, I, I have a very multimodal project here, you know. I kind of feel like uh, I sh sometimes that I should have chose something easier to do <laughs> because we, we got a lot going on in, in um, the Edenic Mosaics project. We got uh, a story that is trying to be told, a technology that's trying to be explored, which it which there's no one synth for. There's different Python scripts and hacked max patches in order to explore this broad realm of concatenative sound synthesis. And then there's all the stuff that I do to the results, you know? How can I make it sound the best coming right out of the concatenator to where I don't need to do a ton of stuff to it afterwards. You know, I feel really proud whenever I have a session and they're just big audio files and they're not like micro edited because, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get away from micro editing in this pro project and, 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 and have the, have the machines do the worry about the variation. I mean, it's interesting thing as well. Like the, um, I remember a buddy of mine during his PhD <clears throat> was doing studying a lot of stuff with Zanakis, and I don't know how much of his music or that stuff you're, but yeah, a lot of computer computer generated and like essentially like sonified algorithm. So he was looking through a bunch of the scores, and then at some point went to the Zanakis estate in Paris or wherever it is, and it was interesting hearing his comments or reflections on it, where he would put things in motion. So it's very mathy, very algorithm heavy but then purposefully fuck with them. Um, so it wasn't just a pure soundification thing. So like you have this processes and there's these pitch sieves and all these things going on, but then there's places where that isn't the case and it doesn't make sense in like a technical thing. Like it, like there are mistakes, I guess you can almost view it as in terms of sonification, but it was his estimation that um, they're there as like a aesthetic override. You know, like, like where, like, he, like, this is what's happening and it's, it's conceptual, you know, like that it's this algorithm playing out or these clusters and all that. But then he reaches his hand in and says, like, nope, I'm not going to have some of that. And that that gesture itself was significant. And I think maybe this is what separates his music from some other music from his contemporaries or other people who work in this manner, where there is that kind of aesthetic override button that he would lean on as a gesture so it wasn't just like the results of that don't sound too great it seemed to be that the the human interfering with the algorithm is part of the algorithm being significant aesthetically i'm definitely stealing that term aesthetic override I'd love, <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to check out that talk sometime too that that sounds great i've only really gotten into zanakis this last year um because uh it, it seemed it seems like once you I finally started reading all this stuff, all roads lead back to Zanakis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, he, he was quite ahead of his time for a lot of things. And, you know, I, I did come up in a lot of like a contemporary classical world of, of music making as well. And I, I don't care for a lot of that. And I think 
some of his stuff I, I still enjoy quite a lot. And it's also been fairly timeless. Like I think he was so ahead of his time and so unique and iconoclastic that it has like it's very identifiably him and it's almost independent of whether you like it or not. It's like, okay, he's doing that thing and it it's it's kind of it's that thing. Um I'll 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 link you. So it's it's Brechton Sharus is my friend who's he's a cool researcher and stuff like that. I think a big section of his PhD thesis which all all is on should be on the University of Hosier webpage, but I'll try to find it and send it along. Goes into some of the stuff of Zanakis and sort of some of his research with certain species in this state, and some interesting analysis he did of specific pieces that like uh, unpack some of the stuff. I think it's it's some of the instrumental music, so I think it's one where it's like a a double bass piece in particular, which is a cool piece and and an interesting analysis. You know the the other inspiration behind this is that um, my partner Catherine is uh, is a writer and she is working on a, a novel right now that's a collection of short stories and each short story is a retelling of the Eden narrative of the of the Genesis narrative and in each story you have all of the players you have man woman God snake and you have a uh, paradise and a seduction and a betrayal and an expulsion. Um, but it happens in different settings. One is like in the future and one is, uh, is, is a story that takes place in Africa between two brothers. And um, it's, it's, it's kind of a creative exercise in telling the same story from a whole bunch of different perspectives. And um uh, Catherine is uh, uh, also uh, really into Jungian psychology, and uh, which is basically the the study of character archetypes. And archetypes are really interesting. It's it's uh, basically a, it's a set of behaviors or personality traits that are pervasive amongst all of of uh, cultures. You know, like for instance, the trickster, the magician, the father, stuff like that. And um, so it, throughout her stories, these different characters, they kind of inherent uh, different archetypes. Like, wh what if what if Eve was the true was the mother? You know, we're going to we're going to make her that archetypal character. And that and how does that character interface with Snake as the magician? Um, so I got really inspired by kind of watching her meditate on these characters and how they would interact, you know, and how how this narrative that everyone knows, that everyone has repeated for centuries, regardless of, uh, you know, whether you're religious or not, you know the story. Um, and uh, it's been really inspiring watching, watching her retell it and rethink it from all these different angles. And um, so that that was the the uh, the reason I chose this story in particular, uh, because um, with with these sounds and and with the way I'm using them, I'm kind of creating not just environments, but but these characters, you know, and thinking about like, well, who is my Adam and Eve? Um, so I, I I very much consider this a collaboration. Catherine comes in as my creative director occasionally, and. She looks at my storyline. She's like, "All right, this has got to be a big moment, but right here, not so much." And and um, uh, it's she's been absolutely integral to my work. Actually, the very first time I've really worked with someone on on a, an artistic project like this, and uh, it was a little nervous going in, but it's 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 turned out to be a really really special thing. Awesome. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a cool perspective. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of collaboration in general and, and I collaborate with my partner quite often in terms of, uh, and, and she's a visual artist, so I think having the, like, not mixed disciplines or whatever, but having a, a, a perspective that's different from what your own background may be is, is super useful because there's often things like that that are considerations that um, you wouldn't normally have which is the, the the case for all collaboration, but specifically when you're collaborating with someone that generally works in a different medium, that's that's often the case as well. So that's, yeah, that's, I could see how some of that like narrativeness um, can come to the foreground and it sort of makes sense like to hear you explain the origin of it there um, and, and how that kind of came to be and, and manifest. I look forward to hearing the sort of the results of that that process, you know? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny just even talking about like the the eden thing like it, like all the the metaphors like all oh, the origin of it and i want to hear the fruits of the labor like like it's just all like i'm just thinking about snakes and apples now you know <laughs> and, and like oh yeah you know it's a really interesting rich topic because we're talking about the creation of the world you know the creation of the cosmos and the and the land and the water and the animals and the vegetation and the people in my mind those are really rich and interesting timbres to work with you know, I've always loved like organic electronic music that has like, you know, not just a snare, but like like a crunch. And and uh, I love using interesting found sounds in beat oriented music like Eamon Tobin, one of my favorites, you know, that kind of kind of sampling culture. So this is uh, uh, very much an extension of kind of that aesthetic. Um, but uh, in, in corpus curation, the cool thing is that this corpus gets bigger. So once you've been once you have water sounds, those water sounds will appear for the rest of the album. I will throw a water sound into a corpus of anything else after that. You know, that was kind of the original concept that everything gets bigger and and uh and 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 things are gradually added and then um catherine helped me out too by saying well all right so you're including water sound and in it's it's there in the corpus now and it can it could show up as in many forms as a melody as a hi-hat as as a whatever uh and she says though you know when you're when you're thinking about these these adam and eve characters in your story you maybe should think about like what elements did these characters embody when they show up, you know? It, yeah, super interesting, and and it's something that like in our initial emails as well, like just the the interest in sound design and the focus on sound design, which is not something that I often think about explicitly, but it's interesting to hear your like unpacking your processes through that and how you choose. I, I mean, in this, I guess having a sub concept, a sub conceptual, but Po like super it's not to do with the adam and eve thing but it's to do with like archetypes within that and how you choose sound design decisions above the material but below the concept i guess that's what i was trying to say above the material and below the concept i love that <laughs> soaking it up right now i'm soaking up the thesis this is my first time writing a um writing a thesis yeah it, it's it was kind of fun like for me like i i mean i came up i didn't do a lot of i mean i, I was educated in the u.s which means badly you know so it wasn't until like I, I moved to the uk that i kind of started getting a better sense of things um 
but yeah, like at the start of my PhD, like I had to do some, um, a few essays during my master's and stuff, but then like I didn't do much of it. I didn't do a great job. They were fine. Um, but it wasn't until I started my thesis and started writing blogs that I started getting a voice going, which I think is a big thing of it. And I think it might be something where, where, um, you'll you'll find your footing there in terms of what you choose to write about because obviously like if you're dealing with aesthetics and philosophy and technology all all of those are like libraries worth of information so like it, it it's as tempting as it is to speak in the general it's often much more useful to speak in the specific you know and that can feel a little counterintuitive it's like oh but like it, it's, it's computers and technology and using them as a human being it's like it's very broad it's like no 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 i'm i'm interested in this and talking about this so it, it took me like a few years of just writing blogs and getting better at writing blogs of and like even just like i made this piece of software it does this this is what i think it's just like a few paragraphs and then just doing this for a few years eventually got like more comfortable with communicating what i thought was important um which is which is I think the 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 bit that took the hardest to figure out because I'm, I'm working worlds in which there's all sorts of subjects and all sorts of things involved, but the things that I find important, um, it took me a bit to kind of narrow that down, and I think that's one of the besides the the technical chops of writing of which mine are not very good, but like I think I, I have an okay sense of like what I think is important and how I want to talk about it. I mean, to be honest, I love your writing. I think your writing is really great. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's funny that you say, uh, use that term, find your voice, because I was using that exact same term when I was originally reading your stuff. I was like, hey, this is helping me find my, find my voice, you know? Um, because like I said, so much of the writing in this world of data science meets art is more skews the data science side. Not that, not to knock that. <laughs> I'm gonna keep keep reiterating. Not that, not that that's. I'm really glad that that people have uh, forged the way there. Um, but it's not me. I'm I'm not uh, going to describe what I'm doing in terms of of um, uh, uh, scientific terms and math and stuff like that. It's just I don't have that training, unfortunately, and. Uh, and it's and yeah, so as a, as an artist, I've been trying to figure out how to talk about things really concisely, which is inclusive of all world knowledge. You know that that isn't isn't you know um, uh, doesn't have as as has as many little blind spots as possible, and um, still fully captures you know what's going on in my head creatively and and artistically. It's it's it, it's been a challenge, and I got. Uh, Actually, just a month from today is when everything is due. I'm about a, a, a third of the way written it, you know, so I got a lot of writing left to do. And, uh, um, you know, organizing all these thoughts around a really coherent, um, organized point has been, I mean, in my it's in my head, but, you know, as soon as I start talking about, you know, about randomness and how it's, uh, the, it's, it's, you know how it uh fits with being an arbiter of results as you say um all of a sudden i feel the obligation to address all the other things that have ever been random and all the other ways that people might have done it because i'm afraid of throwing out oh yeah so ways i've done it is with samplers and granular synthesizers normally the way you get a lot of varied results it's like that's what you could say that in conversation but on paper it's like ah this guy's bullshitting me and <laughs> <laughs> I think that this is where being a teacher has helped me, but also cursed me. You know, I've looked at a lot of papers where I can tell a really good one from a really not so good one, you know, and uh, I, I know what, a, since I know what a really good one looks like, something where you're making points that you can't destroy with a Google search, <laughs> you know. Totally. And and for me, a big shift was like when I was doing my PhD at the end of each year, you have to do like a a mini thesis and a mini defense. It's sort of like, it's not as big as the last one, but like you get used to the process. Um, the first one, I tried to do something more, um, not academic-y, but more formal. I tried to like write things and I tried to communicate. Like I tried to do what um, I thought was required. And it was fine, like I did okay, I got some good feedback. So yeah, for the second year, I was really busy. I was on tour. I, I didn't have like the months leading up to it. I didn't have the headspace to even get anywhere near doing something like that. 
but I did have a year's worth of blogs that I had just randomly written that year just as part of what I did. So I was like, okay, the only thing I can manage to put together is I'm going to write like a little intro. I'm going to copy paste all these blogs and put a little conclusion. And like in it, I'm going to say like, I'm oh, sorry, I'm really busy at the moment. This is all I can manage. And when I did that one, the feedback was way more positive. It's like, do this shit. Don't do that other stuff. This is like this. You're talking about what you think is important. Like, and it didn't have, it wasn't as short up as the other one. Like it wasn't as academic. -y. I didn't have like the references where like it wasn't as um, proper, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to qualify, but it, it wasn't as well done. Um, but the, the voice was much more there because it was my blogs. It was much more colloquial. But also, more importantly, is what I chose to talk about was more honed in and was more what I thought was important. And that ended up being what was more interesting for them to read and what was more communicative about what I was interested in and how I went about it. Rather than me being like, well, you know, when we're doing, when one is dealing with, you know, which is fine, but it wasn't, it wasn't true. I don't live that way. That's not what I'm actually doing. What I'm actually doing is like, oh, wait, that's... What, oh, that's kind of, okay, let me mess with this a little bit. It's like, oh, oh that sucks. Oh, how about this? And it's this kind of like more scattered and more um, exploratory thing that is sometimes not not fully thought through. But that's that's the nature of doing stuff and exploring stuff. And I, I tried to, well, I did capture that because I literally, like, I just copy pasted my blogs and, and pasted it in. And then in the end, I kind of went all in on that approach, basically. That's really helpful advice because, you know, I, I find myself doing that exact same thing. You know, I, I find myself like really trying to be scientific, -y, trying to kind of match the the, um, you know, just just approaching it like I'm trying to contribute something to world knowledge. Um, and um, and that is actually what I really liked about your blogs is that they were, you know, uh, really just got to what you were trying to do. What you're using to do it, ups and downs and stuff like that. So, um, looking at my at my project, kind of the arc of my project, what one thing that uh, that I've been kind of struggling with a little bit in writing this is writing about it is um, kind of the overall format. Like right now, I'm I've I've kind of got a pretty decent chapter one opening. Like this is what I'm gonna try to do. This is how I'm gonna try to do it. This is why I'm interested in this. Um, and this is, this is what I, I, I think the outcome could be, you know, um, on the other, the other bit of writing I've done is observations, um, like, uh, recipes I've been calling them, uh, how to, how to curate a nice corpus, what to do if something doesn't work, you know, and this is going to come along with a lot of examples, like audio examples. This is, this is a failed attempt at trying to do this. And then I did this and this is where I got, but, uh, you know, kind of, kind of some granular examples from the music. Um, and that's also going to come along with presets. I'm going to be releasing a library of all of my audio guide presets I've used for this and all of my NMF based concatenative presets I've used for this as well will be included. Um, however, uh, this, this is a concept narrative and I keep coming back to like, well, if I was reading this and I was I was really interested in it, am I just going to want it to be this is my intent and here's here's the observations? But I so I've been thinking about the middle chapter, like the chapter 2. We have the chapter 1 and then the 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 setup and then the outcomes with the recipes and stuff. And then that middle chapter should be I guess maybe something chronological. But I don't know if it should be chronological in terms of the way I experienced it. Or if it should be chronological in terms of the album, because it's the beginning, middle, end, entire composition. This whole thing. Uh, what? What? I mean, as a reader, do you think that like reading, like you know, in this chapter, track one, this is how I made track one, explode the track into this is how this is what went into it. This is successes and failures. Track two, track two was actually made before track one, but. This is how it was done, and this is what I learned, which I applied later on. You know, like, what what do you think would make more sense in how to tell this story? Yeah, I mean, I guess it obviously depends on the material, but I think, I, I would think of it like um, what was relevant into your, of your thinking, which 
may also reflect the order in which they were made as opposed to the order in which they're presented. So maybe as, and this may relate to chronology of how you made them, but processes that you were thinking about and when you were thinking about them. So maybe for some, like you were really into the NMF stuff for a while and, and that produced tracks four, five, and nine. Um, and there were certain considerations that were important, both technically, but also conceptually that you were dealing with at the time. So maybe those are clumped together. It might also then be beneficial to talk about, again, I don't know if this is relevant for what you're choosing to talk about, is the order in which you're presenting them. Like, is, is it significant that that, you know, that the, the tracks are in this order? And if so, why? If, if this is, again, relevant to what it is you're trying to say at large, because it may not necessarily be. Yeah, you know, my um, advisor, uh, Dr. Martin Parker, I really like the way that he puts it. He's looking for something that's playfully rigorous. <laughs> and so I've had that written in my note the whole time is that uh, rigorous, but playfully rigorous. That's definitely describes the whole, you know, science and art coming together in this project, at least. Yeah, he was great. He was um, like, when you get to the end of your PhD thesis, you have to have an internal um, examiner and external examiner. He was my external examiner, and he was fantastic. It was it was a tr uh, a tough choice because my thesis was it was or is a web thesis, so there's no document. It's just the web page. It's structured very weird. Weird things happen when you're like so. It, it's it's he, he showed me your thesis as an example yeah. of what what a good one looks like. <laughs> Um, but yeah, he was he was the person that we chose for the external because one he did as, as a background in visual art as well. He's into the coding, he's into the improv, and he's you know a funky dude. So it was a good fit, and he was fantastic. Like he very clearly really engaged with all of it, and he said it took him a long time because it's the way the blog is written or, or the thesis is written it is a very bloggy style. So like there's a sentence that like it's 15 words long, where each word is a link or hyperlink, and it's like. So the whole time reading the thesis, he just had like 40 tabs open. It took him like, you know, forever just to, to read this way because it's it's like super dense. Um, but no, he, he did it and he had quite um, meaningful questions and, and meaningful inquiry. But I think the he appreciated and the the format was for one, never a problem, which is good. I, I went into the 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 Viva with stuff in my back pocket of like if I had to defend the format. It, thankfully, it didn't come to that at all. It was, it was. They just they engaged with the format and were happy with it and just talked about the work and stuff. But so he was, yeah. He'll be, he'll be happy with whatever you choose to do. It's almost harder being free form, you know. I want it yeah. to be right. You can do anything, but it has to be right. You know, it's one of those things. It's the, the yeah the option paralysis of 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 writing. <laughs> um, but I mean, with something like that, it, it's it's. I mean, we're having a conversation now, and and we're 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 the conversation is focused around certain areas. So I think it's a matter of finding that, like, what it is you find interesting, and then like like it, it gets very cloudy. And and I've I've absolutely been there, like, and I totally understand that of like when you want to communicate this to someone else, particularly if you're in a, like a, a school context, the it gets blurry right away. Like like if you're just talking with your friends or you're just shooting the shit, it's like oh I'm into this, I'm into this, I'm into this. It's like okay, now write an essay. And it's like oh, like the 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 clarity of that goes away very quickly, and it becomes like like other things take over, and it becomes harder to focus on those things. Whereas I think if you just sort of have a, a chat with whoever about it, that stuff will come up a bit more naturally, and it's just a matter of having the confidence and comfort to just like be like, no, yeah, this is this is the part that I'm into, this these bits. Not there's other stuff. Yeah, that's cool. And, and you may mention them and they're relevant or, or, you know, to what extent or whatever. But like, it's these bits. It's these bits that I find interesting. And then just go with that. And the level of the stuff that you'll be doing or the level of stuff that you're doing can't, you can't talk about everything. It's not possible to go into every aspect of everything that you do is absolutely impossible. So you have to narrow the scope of what you're talking about to the things that are actually relevant or actually interesting which means there's going to be tons of holes in it and it's unavoidable you know that's a that's a good thing to to just you know be okay with to, to say all right i know there's going to be these holes um i'm trying to leave breadcrumbs back to where if you want more information about this go over there if you want to read more about that yeah. there and kind of stick to what i'm trying to contribute <laughs>
while doing all this stuff, uh, you saw in my in my video and the one of the last scenes in my explanation for what I'm doing with this project is that I've been working uh, on my own granular synthesizer that's based on uh, some ear cam objects from 2006 or something by uh, Norbert Schnell, absolute genius. And um, anyway, uh, the, the, these objects can do really interesting things. Um, but uh, but they didn't have a very robust user interface. So I've spent a lot of time this year figuring out interesting ways that you can control these really powerful granular synthesis objects. And um, so while doing all this, I've, I've kind of uh, been really meditating on the uh, uh, relationship between uh, frequency and rhythm. So a lot of the music I've been writing, actually as part of this album, um, kind of takes advantage of that fact, and it does what I call BPM harmonic alignment. And that's when you have a BPM where if you scale up the octave, so 16th, 32nd, 64th, 128th, eventually the note that you get to is a key. Um, so, you know, an uh, equal temperament, that is to say. It's, 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 it's one, of the, one of the notes in equal, in equal temperament. Um, so by that logic... That means that if you're doing a BPM that is in the key of A, that means any po any polyrhythm that you do uh, at that tempo is actually a low frequency harmony. So I've been combining that with um, just intonation, where all of the harmonies are ratios relative to a fundamental. And um, I've been really interested in writing music that is in, in just intonation at a BPM harmonically aligned key. And uh, while playing with this idea and experimenting with things, I discovered that there's some notes that you can hit that are neither a rhythm nor an actual note. There's like this weird range in between that's kind of unexplored. And um, I know about this range because I've done a lot of bass music and dubstep and stuff. We have some unspoken rules. There's only so low that you can go. And that's about in the maybe 26 hertz. That's about where subwoofers below that, they cannot illustrate that range. But I discovered that if you do hit a note that, uh, that's lower than that, you perceive it as kind of a floppy, f flat tire sound. And uh, that is generally an undesired sound in music. You don't want... You just don't want it to sound floppy. It doesn't move the subwoofer, and it and, and it sounds dissonant rhythmically, tonally. Most of the time, people just throw it away. But if the tempo that you're at is is aligned to that floppiness, then the floppiness just becomes a rhythmic subdivision. So I don't. I get so low that I become thirty second notes. You know. Um, so I've been doing uh, a bass lines and synthesis that hits lower notes than what you're supposed to even be able to hear, and then I just put a subwoofer on top of it, which is an octave or two octaves above, and those those notes register as undertones, and they also register as as rhythms. Um, I think that this is a really fun realm that hasn't been explored that much. Especially when you pitch to an electronic producer, hey, I can hit bass notes that you can't hit. <laughs> like, that that much alone is enough to be like, go on. <laughs> That's really cool because, like, because I've, I've, I've read about some stuff of this, like, like same thing, because if you, if you keep multiplying the frequencies up, you end up at color and things. So there's, we can, you know, you can move frequencies from things, but the, the, the relationship is, can sometimes be a little tenuous. So, like, if a G is, like, light blue or whatever it's like that's a like almost a conceptual relationship but here that becomes quite concrete in that like if you do take it into if it is in the same key um when you do get to that low frequency stuff you do end up at ratios that end up being some kind of either rhythm or polyrhythm um which would then yeah I'm, I'm like be perceivable but maybe not in the same kind of way which is yeah that's a quite interesting use of that and I wonder, I mean, you probably end up in some in interesting, like, because um, with BPMs, like, they're not arbitrary, but, like, whether you're 120 or 122, that would make a quite different note if you can scale up a bit. So, like, you'll end up in, like, kind of generally microtonal situations as well, like, in terms of what notes those translate to. 
Um, so yeah, that could be an interesting thing to explore there. Very, very cool. Yeah, I've, I've not really thought about that stuff. Uh, Semi-tangentially, and, and it may be of interest or not, but it, something that um, I, it occurred to me while you were explaining that, one of the uh, professors at Huddersfield, so Aaron Cassidy, he's like an instrumental composer. He's into, I guess, what would be called new complexity, where it's like super detailed, notated, hyper, hyper complex stuff. So instrumental composer, much interesting music, very dense and gestural in a contemporary classical music world. And does a lot of stuff with parametric stuff where it'll be like a cello piece where each finger's motion is notated separately and the bow um, angle position, like everything's like hyper parametric and you have to do these things that are end up producing sounding results. It's interesting stuff in terms of like how it's, it's he's thinking about it. But specifically, he, he gave this talk on, I think what he calls non-geometrical rhythms. Since 2004, my work has focused almost exclusively on the development of an extended tablature notation that has redirected the role of notation from descriptive representations of a desired sounding result towards more prescriptive representations of movements and actions. In the earliest works in this project, for example, in the Crutch of Memory for Solo String Instrument from 2004, shown here, each layer of physical activity, each type of interaction between the player's body and their instrument, is given a separate, discrete staff, and each of these staves are rhythmically independent. Arm position, finger widths, bowings, bow pressure and position, etc., all move independently, and each of these layers is in a more or less continuous state of change. By way of example, here's the final minute or so of the piece. So um, coming from the world of, of notation and, and sort of uh, complexity, the, generally the way that we scale up complexity in terms of rhythm is polyrhythm. And even if you get into like nested tuplets and things like this, it can get very complex, but everything is represented as equal subdivisions of a unit of time that are ratios. So if you have five in the space of four and then seven in the space of that, but like they're equally spaced things. And then that's that's kind of complex, but it, it leaves out all sorts of things like sort of like accelerations, decelerations, um, units that aren't equally spaced uh, and things like this. So there's the the general approach to notation that we have fails when it gets outside of equally spaced whole number ratios. So um, he puts forward an idea about how to, I mean, it, it's largely focused on notation, but it's an interesting way of thinking about some of the things in terms of how to represent or work with rhythms. So the reason this made me think of that is there, is let's say you're doing um, this where you're, you're now in this low frequency range where the note that you go to now ends up effectively being a rhythm because of, you know, the our, our perception and I guess pitch fusion, sensor pitch fusion, there's a name for when we turn repeated phenomena into a pitch, like in a psychoacoustic sense. But let's say you take that rhythm, but rather than it starting on the downbeat, um, it's offset a little bit. So it's a polyrhythm or potentially a polyrhythm or a rhythm depending on, on the tempo and your, your key, but it's now offset. And that might be an interesting thing like where you hear it as like, oh, that's, it's a like 30 second note triplets but it is offset a uh, 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 16th note or something like that. So we hear the rhythm, but it's not quite in the right place. That might be an interesting thing to to sort of play with, but I, I it, it just tangentially remind me of his talk. I think it's, it's like a lecture that he has on YouTube as well that he unpacks it, but that might be an interesting thing to look at in terms of, I don't know, 
rhythm stuff is interesting. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I recently just saw a um an Adam Neely video um about oh, yeah. he yeah he he's got some great vids and recently I saw one about um uh you know having rhythms that are a little off and how we we tend to like that a lot that instead of just that we like and i was thinking about that in terms of synthesis like if you take that and speed it up really fast it almost reminds me of uh kind of how we do pulse waves like if you have a if you have a pulse wave uh, it i mean just a square wave that is evenly divided in the middle that's going to be one sound but if you move where that division is over one way or the other it kind of messes with your perception of what octave that might be you know what i'm saying and um I was thinking that 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 might be something that when you take like different kinds of pulse waves and slow them down enough, you might find swing patterns somewhere there. That might be something to explore eventually. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a, I think Adam Neely has a video or a talk he gave, I think Ableton Loop a few years ago where he talks about, uh, I think fractal rhythms. I don't, I don't, he has a term for it. I, I don't remember what it was where. Yeah. No, a lot of people have linked me to that because be, <laughs> since I've started talking about it, you know, my friends are like, okay, Adam Neely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the fractal rhythm is, he's, you know, he's definitely onto something. The, it, it's there in people's consciousness. But um, it, uh, I don't think it's been thoroughly enough explored, especially in bass music. You know, I think that that um, there's there is a whole world of people out there that would be really, really impressed to hear what does a sixteen hertz bass drop sound like if it was if it was aligned with the BPM and it didn't sound like a floppy flat tire and it had the low end on top of it. How is that going to hit? You know, there's there's all these questions I have in my mind that after I finish this master's, I think that that's what I'm going to start devoting my time to, uh, to to exploring, whether or not I go for a PhD. It was an interesting idea, and I definitely like the the um, what it means practically in terms of like psychoacoustic perception as related to tempo and key, like once you start getting to the low frequencies, because it's it's the 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 first part of it is is interesting but more metaphorical like oh 140 bpms is a flat and that's meaningful because of my chakras you know which is like cool but like it, it doesn't it doesn't it may not necessarily practically mean something but in your case it it does practically mean something once you get into like the ex, like extremes of register it might actually even mean something like at the top as well as you near like like near nyquist and other things too like there there might be implications on that side as well but it's definitely interesting as as a as a concept and as an area to explore, and just like um, almost like in an optical illusion sense, like where you will hear a lower note than is possible. Even just like I, I do this with some undergrad students as well. Like if you filter out all the frequencies of like a low note as you hear on the phone, you still hear it because you psychoacoustically imagine the rest of the partials. You know, like you can very easily end up in territory like that as as well. I imagine. Yeah, you know, this has uh, been my year of experimental electronic music and just kind of removing the expectations of genre or what I, my imagined audience would want to hear or anything. It's been really, I think, healthy to, to kind of jump away from that for a little while. And uh, but then I'm going to I'm going to jump back into really heavy, crazy dance music full force here with this armed with this new idea that maybe I can hit a note that's lower than than what's normally hit. People, people were well, their bodies won't be ready. <laughs> oh, by the way, um, I tried. I tried to download CCC Combine early on in this project, and um, it, uh, it 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 didn't didn't work. Are you still working on that? So there's the old version of it, which I think of as I've been told, I haven't personally used that one in a while. I don't think it works in post Mac six anymore because of weird stuff. But the um, the Max for Live device version one um, does work, and it's 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 there. I I've 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 that's essentially been done for like three maybe four years now. Where like I think like I do want it to have a couple passes of of final fine tooth comb, make sure there's no little bugs kind of thing. And then the main thing is um documentation like it's such a it's a conceptual thing that i think like everyone's like yeah here cool this thing's done go use it and people are like 
I, I don't know what this is. I don't know how to use like it does a disservice to the the kind of idea. So I, I've I've just been yeah, like it, it's a little bit in a limbo state where I just need to get around to doing that part of it. So I've been trying to kind of use, you know, offline stuff, online stuff, max real time, C sound, just get a really a large perspective of what's out there and yeah your your um cc combined was was on my list of I, I i still really need to dig into that and and see if that fills a hole see if that fills a hole in in what i uh, uh what i'm doing and what i can't do with with other things and uh because i have not found a good real-time thing yet you know yeah I mean, it's have a, have a go. the The tech is a little old in it. Like it, it does. It's pre flucoma and it's doing. It's descriptor based. It's just uh, four descriptors: so uh, loudness, pitch, uh, centroid, and spectral flatness. Um, and it's using um, just the nearest distance matching. So, like post flucoma, there there could be a much more sophisticated version of this. I. When I was finishing this up, the Fukuma project was starting, and I, I decided early on that I was like, "This device will will use the technology that I had at the time," because you can just obviously keep reinventing the wheel over and over. Like I didn't want to just every time there's new tech re. I mean, there might be a, a future version of it that does things completely differently, but um, the core nugget in there is is uh, it, it isn't using Fukuma stuff. By the way, love your ultimate onset detector in the Flucoma boards. There's a long thread and you're like, I was on a mission to make the best onset detection and uh, combining two um, uh, envelopes I just thought was was brilliant. And, and I've, I, I don't know what I'm going to use that for yet, but I've been I've been waiting to, to embed that into something. Yeah, I mean, the, the that algorithm, I mean, I, it's, I didn't come up with the algorithm, but it, it's it's the um, in uh, it's fluid amp slice is that same algorithm. It's just as an external. Ah, I was wondering about that. That's funny. Well, that's the cool thing about the fluid stuff is that you can open up any of them up and it's. You can see that it's it's made out of stuff you could already do, and that's something I just thought was really really cool about the Flucoma mission, is they're not they're 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 really beautifully using the stuff that already exists and packaging it together in a way that makes sense. Yeah, I've just dragged into the chat there this um, other uh, little zip file here. So that has I did a few years ago a talk. At a university, it was a workshop, I guess, at this university in Madrid when I was living there on concat stuff. So as part of it, I took what is essentially the core nugget of um, CC Combine and made it like pulled everything out that doesn't need to be there. So I've, I've dragged this in there. So there's like a text file, which is the talk that I kind of unpack some of the um, the things in it, some of the things that it does and, and how it goes about uh, correcting certain things. I mean, it isn't. I went about more things in person, um, but like I do kind of unpack some things. But uh, just to show you, because this might be useful just for you to play around with, because this is literally the CC Combine does more than this in terms of like it does correction and compensation, and you can have multiple corpora at the same time, etc. But um, it does an analysis step, it converts the things. Um, you can create your own corpus here where it just analyzes the same things and it writes it to a text file and then it matches for the nearest one. So this is basically uh, the, the core bit of that one patch, just everything else stripped out. So this is like a, a, good, a good kind of jumping out point for doing some things from scratch. And it's sort of fairly well labeled. It's, it's you know, I just did this as like to be able to do it like in a couple hour workshop things, how to explain things and how to use it. So like if you load a corpus in here, it, like in the vanilla settings, it sounds exactly like CC Combine. It just doesn't have all the other bells and whistles and stuff. But so I've put that in the chat there as well. So if you want to have a look at that. That's great. Well, I'm going to I'm going to I got my homework for me today. Um, we're we're uh, we're we're getting to about two hours, so I don't want to take up too much of your time today. But this has been a, such an enlightening conversation. I can't thank you enough for putting putting this together. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome, and, and thanks again for taking part. Like it's it's 
these bubble parties have been quite uh, well received. Like there were just an outgrowth of, of doing these gib gab chats for like a really long time that it's, um, it's a way to make some of those things like temporarily and spatially more relatable. So like, like this is a cool conversation we've had and hopefully it's been useful for you, but then there'll be someone else who, you know, a few months from now might come across the video and be like, oh, that's, these are references I've never heard about. This is really cool. And it opens up their own wormholes and it's like a way of, um, extending the sort of usefulness and like the the gesture of sharing and openness and 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 communication just to to more people so yeah thanks for being cool taking part now i'm going to send you out with some more audio excerpts thanks for watching and i hope that you've enjoyed mm -hmm.